Thank you. Um, thank you to the Time staff for having me here to talk about my passion in life, which is how do we get clean, reliable electricity to everyone. So this journey started for me about a decade back. I was hitchhiking in Malawi, as you do. And um, I wanted to go scuba diving in, in Lake Malawi, so I ended up uh, doing that and seeing those little chicklids that have their, you know, their babies going in and out of the mouth. And um, after uh, I got out of the water, the, my guide invited me for dinner. And so uh, you know, I waited, and he came to pick me up, and it was dark then. And he took me by kerosene lamp, and he led me through these dark back alleys and streets. Uh, we sat in his backyard, and we had, we had an amazing meal with his family. And on that journey, I realized, wow, nobody in this whole town has electricity. This is, must be 10,000 people in this town. And, uh, not a one of them had um, so much as an electric light bulb. Um, and that was a huge eye-opener for me. I kept thinking, why, why doesn't he have a solar panel? Like, is it really, is it just so expensive? Um, and that, uh, that stuck with me over the years. And I had, I had the good fortune to spend a year at Oxford uh, as, a, as a school scholar. Um, I had three, three, four years after that, and got to dive really deep into this problem. And uh, what I found was that there was a market leader for off-grid electrification. It was kerosene. And of course, it's a terrible solution, right? Burning jet fuel in your living room would not seem to be the, the thing you want to do. But it, um, you could buy in really small increments. There's no technical risk. If you don't have money one night, you don't need to buy it. Um, doesn't work very well, but it works. It might burn your house down, but it works, and you do need light. You need, you need light for your kids to study. Um, and then it turned out this wasn't a small number. So this wasn't a little bit. This was $20 billion a year uh, just spent on kerosene, like let alone diesel for diesel generators, let alone battery for radios, um, as a substitute because, again, folks didn't have access to electricity. Um, so in, uh, in early 2012, I um, had been an e-commerce entrepreneur, so I was, was completely unqualified for this, and uh, moved to Tanzania with a, with a couple co-founders and, and raised a little seed capital to, to start this business. And uh, we didn't go with any technology. We didn't go with any um, uh, preconceived notions. We just wanted to sit in as many living rooms as we could and, and try to understand uh, what people needed and what they already spent and work our way backwards from that. So what was the cash already being spent on and could you give folks uh, something 10 times better? And so as uh, over the years we, we evolved and we learned from our customers, we came up with this, uh, this concept of prepaid plug and play uh, solar. So this is a, a typical bar in Ivory Coast with a fan, a, a TV, lights, all powered by that, uh, nothing more than that panel on the roof. Um, so the company today has, uh, has investors like Tesla, uh, DBL, uh, big, big oil companies like Total are investors in this company. Um, over 140,000 customers, but still very, very early days. Um, you know, we are, we are talking about less than, um, our, our sector as a whole of off-grid solar in Africa, we probably cover, let's say, three or four percent of the people that, that need our services, even at a most basic level, let alone to their aspirations. Um, so I wanted to tell you guys about two, two things that I've learned along the way that I thought might be interesting. Um, about solar in Africa. So one is just that this is a huge opportunity. I think folks don't fully uh, appreciate it. So you're talking about a continent where two out of three people are not connected to the electrical grid, and that population is going to double next by, by 2050. So we're going from one billion to two billion, roughly. Um, for those lucky enough to be connected, that does not mean you have reliable, affordable electricity. That is the exception. So not uncommon to see 50 cents a kilowatt hour, not uncommon to see the power grid on half the time. Uh, so one estimate, uh, I think this is African Development Bank, is that's 4% of GDP. So you think about one of the things that keeps Africa poor is a lack of affordable, reliable electricity. Um, so we see Africa in this chart by McKinsey twice. At the bottom is the current installed electrical capacity in uh, the entire continent, and then kind of up there in the middle is 2040. So what's interesting about that is we're going to quadruple the installed capacity, and even that's not remotely going to meet the, the full demand. So it's the equivalent of adding Japan's electrical grid to the continent. And we have an opportunity to build this in whatever way with whatever technology uh, we, we find most relevant. Um, so here's the other thing that's really important to understand is this is a complicated market. Um, things we take for, advantage, uh, for granted, like paved roads, can't be taken for granted in Africa. Um, we can't take advantage uh, for granted that people have bank accounts or credit cards. Um, 
This, uh, this picture I took of the weak grid here, this was it from Ghana. Um, those wires have no electricity flowing through them. So the government put up those poles and those wires uh, before the election about a year ago. Um, but it's really expensive to run the high voltage line to those wires to power them. So they remain unpowered. So what do we do? We, we design for this complexity. We design it in the hardware, we design it in the business model. We, we have some of the best engineers in Silicon Valley working on, on these problems. Um, so what do you do about bad roads? Well, you make sure your stuff can be installed on a motorcycle. You make sure you don't need to roll a truck to, uh, to install a solar system. Uh, if folks are on banked, you can use mobile money. And this is probably the single greatest enabler of this, this business model and all kinds of interesting business models in Africa. You know, I'm an e-commerce guy, and, and we used to take Visa cards from U.S. consumers. Um, a mobile money payment from a uh, Tanzanian villager is, is fraud-free and half the cost. So incredibly more effective, more reliable than a Visa card from a, from a U.S. consumer. Um, so one other thing folks don't realize is, is there is microfinance in some of these markets, but it's really, really, really expensive. So you're talking about interest rates that can be in triple digits. So what do we do about that? A couple things. So one is it's a lot easier to finance an asset rather than just give folks a loan, right? So this has prepay, prepayment built in. You have to pay your monthly payment in advance for the power to come on, which is a good motivator to, to make your payment. And so this allows you to get very high payment rates from unbanked uh, populations. Um, also designing for plug and play. Any, any one of us in this room could install our, our solar system easily. And this is, a, this is a full home system. This is TV, this is fans and radios and lights in every room. Uh, we don't wire the home, for example, because that adds cost and complexity. So it's literally plug and play. Um, and this is one other thing. Uh, you know, the market here is based around uh, you know, net metering and, and policy, but, but there the market is really energy independence. You know, folks really care about um, being independent, owning their power rather than, uh, rather than paying a bill, and that I think really speaks to people. So just want to leave you with one uh, thought, and uh, we'll have my email address up on the next slide if anybody wants to reach out. You know, we have an opportunity to build a bit of what I would think of as a bottom-up grid, and that's a lot of what we think about and we, we work on is there, is there are advantages to networking of power, and there's also a lot of advantages to individuals owning energy assets, both storage and, and solar, right? So every one of our systems has storage built in, it has generation, and it's right where the customer needs it. So you can imagine a demand-driven electrical solution rather than a supply-driven one, and I don't think we've ever really uh, seen this before. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.